Hi there, my name is Bolu, and today I'm going to talk about superposition in neural network representations. So I guess to motivate that a bit, um, I'll share some context about where this hypothesis comes from or the field of neural network research. This field is called mechanistic interpretability, and basically it has, um, it follows from like, the following reasoning, okay? So we all understand that neural networks solve an increasing number of important tasks really well. And it would be at least interesting and probably important to understand how they do that. So MechInterpret is basically a subfield that tackles this problem by seeking granular mechanistic ex explanations for different observed behaviors in neural networks. It's basically pushing back on the idea that neural networks are just these black boxes that are completely inscrutable and just do magic with linear algebra. So it, it pairs into a given network at a granular level um, to investigate some very isolated behavior. At the same time, it also has very broad um, hypotheses and theories about how neural networks do things. And one of these is about representation learning. That is how do neural networks learn which representations to use for inputs and how are these inputs, how these representations passed around in the computation. Um, right, so that's what this is. Right, so basically understanding what a model sees and how it does. So what information have model found important to look for and how is information propagated um, and I guess represented and propagated internally in the network. And I guess to paint a picture of what we mean by representations and propagation. So basically um, at the bottom left, on the bottom left here, we have, um, let's just say this is like a simple tokenized version of input you're gonna pass on to based on a transformer, right? So you have like on colon off, wet colon dry, old colon. And I guess as any of us would would attest to from using something like ChatGPT, um, these, neural, these neural networks are definitely able to predict that, oh, I figure that the next thing is going to be old colon new, right? Since you can figure out what you want an opposite. So the idea is that like between this entry of our text and the prediction on the other side, entire network has to have encoded certain information and done, trans and done computations in the process to get this output of, oh, the next thing to come after this column is new. So basically, the, what we're trying to ask is, okay, just what do we know and what can we investigate about how this information is encoded, right? So Because in the beginning, all it knows is that I'm a column, again, after going through just the embedding network of mapping the column character to um, a, a, a collection of numbers are just called vectors, or ordered vectors, as you can see there in the column. So the question is, somewhere between entry on I'm a column to exiting on my next is new, which is again, the, the result of this vector going through an unembedding layer and a softmax. And again, the highest probability weight being attributed to, um, as again, where this first in place, let's assume the word new is his own token. Um, because as we know, like prediction is done on a token basis. So right, so somewhere between signing with Emma Colin, I'm an X is new, is a bunch of stuff. So what do we know about what these representations look like internally? All right, so here are a couple qualities of these representations that the a certain school of mechanistic interpretability posits. Basically, it says that the, there are discrete features that a model has learned to look for in an input. And these discrete features basically compose into giving any given representation, right? So if we look at any layer or at any component in the architecture, um, all the information the model has at that stage is basically going to be some compos composition of discrete things. Um, and the second is linearity. And so this basically takes the, compos the decomposability statement a bit further to say that not only are these discrete components um, composed together, they're composed linearly. Um, and again, we'll discuss a bit later what exactly that means. And the third, it basically just says, um, we can think of these discrete qualities as something called features. And again, the precise technical definition for what features are comes later. Um, so I guess maybe to summarize, maybe this like one single line or tagline, it probably like summarizes the school of thought that says, Language model, again, you can replace with neural network representations that basically have similar architectures. Um, so language model representations are linearly decomposi decom decomposable into features, right? Um, so again, we're going to pick apart each one of those, um, of those items in the course of this talk. Um, the first 
again, is this is kind of a weak statement. It's not that strong, and I'll, I'll explain why. In isolation, decomposability just basically means that, well, we assume that neural networks learn different things. That is, giving a neural network doesn't just um, basically memorize every sim simple potential input. It learns to, to abstract certain features like blueness or redness, or perhaps even more general to color, right? If it has a general abstraction for um, color representations. Um, again, this in this simple case, we have a neural network that may be trained to identify um, colors and shapes. Like, so let's just say maybe this is like some uh, classification um, neural network, right? And the idea is that, okay, somewhere in, you know, all, um, all the neural network weights are basically transformations that are able to extract um, certain discrete qualities, such as the center shape or the background color, right? Here, we've simplified it to just look for blueness or redness on the left. But the interesting thing is, well, this is kind of just saying sometimes neural networks don't overfit, which is why I said this is kind of a weak statement, because like, sure, like it's pretty obvious that, yes, I mean, or at least like anyone that has training neural network can demonstrate in with like a test set to show that, yes, indeed, these neural networks can generalize and not everything is overfitting or memorizing. So on the right there, if we have something like a purple um, triangle that supposedly this neural network has not seen in training before, it could depend on its previous previously learned features uh, to say that, well, even though like it doesn't quite have a conception of purple as a distinct thing, it could compose of, of the color purple as being having, um, again, perhaps reading the RGB values um, being equally composed of um, red and blue um, values, right? So, right, so, and, so at this stage, like, all that's all decomposability is saying. Um, there's certain things in this diagram that are quite strong assumptions. Again, this whole idea that, oh, there's one thing called a blue neuron. As we'll see, that's a pretty strong thing to say, and it's not obvious at all that this is how things play out in reality. But again, at this stage, decomposability just says um, a representation is composed of a bunch of little stuff because a neuron network, um, again, demonstrably does not just generalize all the time, right? Again, at for sufficient size for a sufficiently small problem um, set. The second is linearity, right? So this, again, takes the decomposability um, property a bit further. You say that, okay, cool. Not only are these different properties, um, well, distinct or different, they combine linear sums, um, quite simply, which basically just says, if you can imagine a vector representing um, a certain vector direction representing some feature. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's pretty, this isn't as contrived, right? Because remember, looking at this diagram, um, the inputs are already ordered collection numbers. So again, everything that's for a column is already inherently have, having this vector format. Again, I, I should mention though, that just because a thing is an ordered collection of numbers, it doesn't mean it has to be linear, right? So it's a bit confusing, oh, obviously, because it has this like, um, vector formatting of, again, an ordered collection of numbers relating to one entity, then surely it must obviously be in a direction. That is not obvious. And again, I'll show you examples of what the, um, that uh, looks like when it's not the case. Okay. Um, so again, linearity just says these decom decomposable um, sub vectors basically literally just add together to give you the representation for something, right? So here we have how the against some other neural network um, that cares about size and redness in the abstract, um, has two different directions. Um, again, given it only has two features or qualities it cares about, it, it can dedicate two different directions to it, right? And then these directions can simply combine um, to, to represent any one given input. And again, like how do we have any evidence for this in practice? Is that yes, um, I guess this is a bit of a, a popular example by now, but there was a paper that came out a couple years ago um, that basically showed regularities in the differences between like pairs of vectors, right? So the difference between the man and woman, again, this is like the man and woman, uh, let's say like word representation in certain uh, language model architectures was consistent, right? So if you do something as silly as, let's say, su subtracted the vector, again, just the ordered collection of numbers for, of of uncle from the vector for aunt and you simply just impose that on let's say some other 
pair um, on something like uh, man, you would end up with precisely um, the vector called woman, right? And you have a bit of this like vector algebra here on the right with the card. Again, let's assume this is like another relationship of plurals again, um, and, uh, of like cars, the vector representation for cars. If you subtract the singular representation for car and add to apple, you get something like apples, right? Again, so this kind of behavior of literal like um, ordered subtraction of values um, is what you would, you would see in a linear system, right? A system where um, the masculine, um, you know, this abstract feature of, of this is referring to a masculine um, entity is encoded with all the other stuff that has to do with royalty in, in king or has to do with um, relatives or relatives of uh, siblings of your parents and uncle and aunt, or just again in the literal word man, uh, man and woman. Effectively, if, if these two, if these multiple things are composed in a linear fashion, then you can get away with doing things like this um, vector subtraction and arithmetic as we're seeing here, right? Um, but again, this doesn't mean everything completely is, is indeed, right? So this is part, this is just for the embedding layer. And again, to remind us what the embedding layer is, it is the very bottom of this, right? It's, um, it, there's still a lot of uncertainty as to, sure, if maybe for simple things like embedding um, a word, um, you, you get this vector algebra. Does that mean like for everything in all the layers in the network and um, all the information that it has to encode um, is in fact composed in this linear fashion, right? So that is why there's still a mystery even though we have seen some evidence. Um, and I guess, as I mentioned, it would be worth noting again, just because the thing is a, an a ordered collection of numbers, again, which is how neural networks um, tend to be like represented or, or simply just how they are, right? This kind of this meme around how neural networks are just linear algebra scaled up. Um, well, just because things are in auto collection numbers doesn't necessarily mean that they are linear, right? Linearity is a very particular statement about how different entities interact, right? So here's an example of, again, on the, we can imagine a different regime where we had um, a neural network that, again, was able to extract a discrete component for redness and another for blueness, um, but then joining them together, it did something like, well, maybe just exploited the um, the simple uh, pr precision, like like decimal places, right? So again, it's how it does this, again, special addition is by simply just taking the first thing on the left and then making it um, the value to one decimal place and take, taking the other thing. Uh, and here you have like an algorithm to do this. And again, this is an example of a non-linear um, expression. Um, and again, like the component of this that makes it non-linear is you see it, re it relies on the floor operation. Again, this is like from um, say, like from a Python except that is like math of floor. It basically just like tries to do, do the rounding. That's basically how to exploit this like um, uh, precision and placement to basically like squish uh, these two different values together, right? So again, so this is just like one, um, I guess like dummy example um, of showing that, well, yes, things, ordered collection of numbers can act in ways that um, are not quite vector-like or, or don't quite simply just do addition, right? Um, you do have other compression schemes. Um, right, and so what the linear representation is saying is that actually um, on the journey from, again, the input of I am a colon, which is what like the embedding does to the output, um, all the information it has at that point, or again, all the information that this sing single um, colon in the input has maintained as it went through all the layers, were simply just added to each other, right? So there's one vector that represents, oh, there's something, there's a bit of like a word and opposite game going on. Um, and there was an inter interesting paper that, that showed up to say that actually, yes, not just um, nouns or discrete informations about inputs can be encoded, but also abstract things like functions, right? Again, this whole idea of, oh, this is a word and opposite game that's being played here between wet and dry, old and new ETC, um, that itself is one vector. And there's yet another vector Again, this this is something that attention can give us, right? Being able to basically like look at um, previous inputs. So again, the colon token is able to like look behind, immediately behind it to see that oh, the thing that came before me is old, and also is able to look um, a bit further back to other things to like glean the pattern of words and opposites, right? All these different bits of information are literally just different vectors or different directions that compose as simple additions to, to end with the conclusion of, okay, surely my next thing is new. 
um, again, the, the representations are really concerned with how the network is doing computation. That is like, like what are the mechanics inside of it that know how to do that? Okay, given this vector for working opposite this vector for this, how does it do that? Like, again, there's another body of work that explores basically this like algorithmic interpretability. This is just saying, um, basically the variables that is being used for these computations, what do they look like and how are the variables that composed, um, um, and again, by how I mean like, um, how many sets of like other saying like, do you have weird stuff like this going on? Where it's like um, in the C, in the space of all potential transformations of taking redness and blueness together to get purpleness, um, is it like some unknown arbitrary thing which would be messy and hard, or is it just literally simple vector addition? Um, so that's what representation is as being like distinct to like algorithmic uh, interpretation interpretability. Um, right. So again, as we see here, um, again, just think of the linear composition as just a compression scheme for how all this information is packed together. Okay. So linearity is great because it basically helps us narrow down. Um, again, as I said, like one compression algorithm in a very large function space. So there are many things. Again, these are the giant networks to be doing in their like typical inscrutable fashion. Um, so like, linearity is pretty helpful in that. Okay, actually, kind of narrows it down um, to one like well-known and studied, um, uh, basically like compression scheme, right? Which is the entire field of linear algebra, right? If it happens to be linear. Um, and also the other things that this gives us as well, which is it, it aids in diagnostics and helps improve uh, our understanding of the models in ways that, again, if there were some, if for example, in every single representation or every single layer use a different type of arbitrary algorithm will be hard. Um, so again, like it basically would be very convenient if this was the case, right? And again, we have seen some evidence for it, right? So I, so this is what just an important point to make where to, to state that and this is a combination of having some evidence, but also there's a bit of a motivated um, inquiry into this, right? Again, if, if this wasn't something we cared about, there are many things about neural networks that seem to be interesting, but people just haven't like really like dug into, but the fact that they seem to have linear behavior um, has drawn a, a very large community of researchers to study just why. Because again, um, it makes the problem a lot more tractable than if it wasn't the case, right? Um, and yes, I, I guess I, I put here effectively mind control, meaning like they're a bit of like, um, as these tools become more mature to understand what's happening, we get to do different things like um, everything from mind reading to mind control. That is like, again, if you get to run this giant brain on a computer and you have access to all the numbers and you understand the general, both the algorithms for how the information is represented and how the information is transformed, then you can eventually like intervene and, uh, or at least just like, you know, have uh, a log stream on what's going on. Cool, so that's the motivation for why linear composability is great, right? Um, because again, it's a algorithm for these transformers to use um, for our understanding. Okay, um, here is a bit of the downside is that linearity is kind of demanding in that it basically says that to have a lossless compression scheme that composes linearly, it requires as many dimensions, i.e. as many of those different boxes, um, as many like of the, as many distinct ordered numbers in the collected set um, as you have qualities you want to encode, right? As you can see here, um, again, we have something for redness, for blueness, for squareness, for triangleness, and then like, as you see, um, you basically, you have this like one hot vector kind of situation going where um, the thing that makes one of these directions um, encode for the property of redness is that it is only the first cell that activates for it. Now, I, I, want, I do want to point out that there's a slight difference between just the dimensions and uh, like the, the number of dimensions is the requirement. It doesn't necessarily mean though that you would always have this perfect idea of um, one cell coordinating to one thing, right? You you could basically have like there are you know infinite many um, orthogonal bases that are able to achieve this. Basically, all you just want is that for you want to have as many orthogonal um, directions as you have features, right? But again, just for um, the sake of like easier understanding, um, we just focus on the one in this very large, this infinite set of orthogonal bases that happens to um, be one hot encoded, right? Um, 
So again, just going for just imagine that every time I talk about um, a neuron or a dimension, I just literally mean one neuron, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, cool. So why is this a problem? Okay. Uh, so let's just like again to remind ourselves of like where we're at right now. Again, this certain hypothesis for how representation is done says that language model, large language model representations are linearly decomposable composable into features. Okay. Um, this brings us to the linear representation puzzle. Why is this a puzzle? Um, so basically, in a couple steps. First, we have some evidence that indeed LLMs do represent stuff linearly, right? Again, so like meaning this, um, this claim has you know some basis in reality, right? And again, there are other several other arguments in research to suggest that like this behavior is more likely or like or has either from or can be observed either from like looking at the number of flops that are dedicated to linear transformations versus not etc. Um, cool. So linear stuff is happening. Um, linear combinations require as many dimensions uh, or neurons again, which is again a, a subset of, of the case of the orthogonal bases as features, right? Again, so if you want to encode for redness, blueness, blueness, triangleness, and uh, squareness, you need literally four different things. Again, if you want to encode for these things distinctly as being like different things, I can need four different directions, okay? Um, however, and this is where the puzzle comes, um, in experience, it seems that these networks are able to represent way more stuff than they have neurons for, right? And again, I have a bit of like um, a back of the envelope calculation here where GPT-2 has on the other of like hundreds of thousands of neurons. Again, it, the exact number might vary on the architecture, but basically, but if you look at the number of attention heads, MLP layers, and the dimensions that these architecture components operate with, um, you, you are in the order of a couple hundred thousands of neurons. Uh, and the assumption is that these models encode a lot more than that. And if you're finding it hard to wrap your head around what about how a hundred thousand, a couple hundred thousand um, features is not enough. Remember that again, this is encoding all of the English language, right? Or all of language. Um, if you if you recall like how how well GPT-2 was able to perform, um, it is plausible to say that yes, it probably encodes a lot more than a couple hundred thousand features, right? Because again, this is like all of language itself. Um, so the question is like, how? How's that possible? Again, we know that um, linear, um, so basically we seem to have like conflicting or contradicting evidence. One, we have evidence of linearity, but at the same time, um, we have evidence of linearity. We understand what linearity needs, which is as many neurons as it has features. But at the same time, we have models um, in production. We have experimental models that seem to do um, quite well without having um, as many uh, Neurons as they seem to have features, right? And again, this is this is this. Is, so I appreciate why this is a puzzle. You just have to depend on like your gut feeling of like there are probably more than two hundred thousand things that GPT two is looking for in in you know any given sentence. Right? Remember how like open ended all of language is, um, and and again this is one one of the difficulties in like describing what exactly a feature is. Um, so a feature basically, if I think of a feature is one help definition. Like a feature is a, a thing that a neuron a neuron would be dedicated to in a sufficiently large um, uh, language model, right? But again, we'll get to that shortly. Okay, cool. So this is our puzzle. How is this happening? There's a great paper that came from a team at Anthropic that basically tries to, basically building off of previous work, exploring this puzzle, um, suggests a way forward on on tackling what, what exactly is going on and basically being able to um, being able to disentangle, um, you know, all the mess that seems to be happening because again, something is kind of very strange. Um, but I guess basically before this paper came out, um, the same team um, introduced the idea of uh, superposition, and superposition is basically a hypo hypothesis that attempts to answer the puzzle, the riddle of how can a model do more, represent more features than it has neurons. Now, it effectively says that neural networks are able to do this because they exploit feature sparsity and the relative feature importance. Uh, it basically just says that like the model does not in fact do perfectly lossless compression, but it trades that off in exchange for representing more features um, because of a property 
called like feature sparsity, which basically means that again, even though the English language or like any arbitrary text in English language or like in the set of all possible texts of of coherent English language sentences or perhaps not even, not even coherent, um, even though those contain a very large number of features, um, it turns out not all those features are active at the same time. And there's a great, and this provides an opportunity for a trade-off where you can say, okay, what if I choose a not perfectly orthogonal um, set of vectors to represent my features, uh, which, which again is the requirement for there to be a lossless compression. Um, what if instead I chose um, N plus M, let's say I chose a bit more than this ideal set of perfectly orthogonal vectors, and in exchange, um, basically each additional direct feature direction that I add basically adds some noise, again, using the compression analogy, add some noise. Basically, I trade off a little bit of noise for having a much wider set of features that I can represent. And again, this only works if all features are not present together. Because again, if all features are, are present all the time, um, that again, if you have no um, sparsity, you will have noise in all your outputs. Um, and yeah, this is what this is what this is saying, right? Um, so in the top, in the top three boxes you have there is basically saying, okay, you have um, again all the you, all the different like dots are meant to be different features that your model cares about. Again, maybe one of them is redness, one of them is blueness, one of them is squareness, etc. Um, and you can see you have like a two dimensional surface. You have a two dimensional surface. Um, in the case where there's no sparsity, right, where every feature is as likely to be important as the other, you effectively have um, what, we ex what we expect. That is like the neural network indeed only has two directions to represent the two things, um, most important things it cares about, okay? And again, let's just imagine right now that they're all equally important, so it just like randomly chooses two features. Again, maybe it only cares about um, having a distinction between redness and and it's unable to, to have a distinction between um, squareness and triangleness, for example, right? It basically just chooses like one pair that is, um, you know, is the best it can do to like get a good classification um, loss um, on the problem set, okay? But it turns out that as you increase sparsity, right? As you maybe make um, uh, redness and uh, circleness not as common, for example, let's say you, you had a case whereby um, sometimes the image has no shape in the middle, that is sometimes it's just color that matters, and sometimes you have a completely colorless input, but it's just the shape in the middle, right? Again, that's what sparsity means, right? Um, where you have like two different, in this case, you have like more than two different um, properties that don't always coincide together, right? Um, it turns out that in the 80% sparsity example, as you see here, it actually chooses to represent more features than it should be able to, right? Um, and again, this is consistent with what we've seen by experience. And on the right here, you, you see the 90% sparsity case, it basically has that direction showing that, okay, that's what, spark, that's what inference means. Inference, because again, the whole point of having an orthogonal uh, basis is that if you try to extract the component feature that is, again you have some vector and then you, you have only again two potential orthogonal um, features if you do a dot product against each of these each value you get is um, basically saying how much this giving vector is composed um, of each of those directions so basically if you have again some direction for some representation of um, a red square basically if you take a dot product of that against the redness direction it gives you oh this is either um, really red or not that much red and you take a dot product of that against um, the the squared direction it says oh how much of it of the, does this look like a square right so it's basically so that's why these need to be orthogonal like they shouldn't interfere with each, with each other like the quality of redness should not interfere with the quality of squareness if that makes sense um, so that's why orthogonality is important um, however, again, if sometimes you basically just get um, a colorless square or you get um, a shapeless color, basically you just have any potential a color or a shape, i.e. the sparsity, where like you don't always have cases where these two um, show up together, um, 
And again, for your problem for your problem set, you only need to care about these in isolation. That is, you only need to be really good at detecting color sometimes or detecting shape sometimes. It turns out that you would actually be fine if you chose directions for squareness and redness that interfered. That is what the bottom example was trying to show. Okay. So on the bottom left square, you have our let's say our orange vector is the thing that we actually want to observe. Again, it's our um, red square, right? It's 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 a thing. Um, it's the input. Is 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 the true input um, vector, right? Um, and you see that again, we have five different directions, five different features. There's this. If you take a dot product of this value against all the different five different vectors to see like how much um, it it has a value with all of them. So you see it is along one direction, for example, right? So that direction would have its given value, right? Let's say that direction means how red it is. Um, however, because there's interference, it has tiny little vectors that are going in along the other features that it actually doesn't have. Again, we're, we're, let's imagine that in this case, we have a simple case of where, oh, this input is simply just, again, a very red input, right? It's just like a red blob or like a red um, square, right? Uh, sorry, not a red square, like, I mean, just like a red image. There's nothing else in it. So indeed, it, is, it aligns perfectly with one of the features. But again, be, but because in this representation, again, you have only two dimensions, um, two pure dimensions, but then you're trying to squish five different things inside, um, you would actually have a little bit of, you would pick up a little bit of a component along other features that it actually doesn't have. So that is what interference is. Um, and however, why this works is that neural networks have non-linearities, um, basically like the activation functions um, are non-linearities that are able to basically turn off these um, tiny, tiny bits of noise, right? Um, if they didn't have that, then the, the bits of noise become quite annoying and would actually like count more towards your errors. But because again, in a case whereby there's actually is very little um, noise coming from the other values in the dot product, these are able to be tuned off effectively, right? Um, so now let's imagine now on the bottom right, in this case, let's imagine that the true input, again, like this thing we care about, um, the two blue um, vectors. Again, that is like you have something that is a really big square and it's also a really like yellow um, background. Okay, so again, you have um, squareness and you have yellowness. Um, if you can observe this vector addition of these two, again, remember we're operating in like a linear combination regime. Uh, this is exactly the same thing as we get on the left. This is why interference is important because interference requires that like for it to work, there should be only a very few number of things. In this case, I just say like for, for interference to have no impact here, um, it should only be one feature that is truly trying to be detected at a time. But in a case whereby the two blue directions are trying to be, um, it would look to our system, our neural network, as if it was actually this case on the left. And, in, and as we've seen, it is going to end up chipping away those two different values to nothing because of the nonlinearities. I'm going to think that, oh, actually, instead of seeing a square, a yellow square, it's just going to see um, a circle. Maybe that's what that third direction represents, which is complete noise, isn't it? Or well, it's completely wrong, so to speak, right? It's basically going to end up ignoring the components of this vector along those two as just being noise, which is really bad, which is really why in the case where there's no sparsity, where like, again, all the features are likely to be active, the neural network doesn't, doesn't even bother trying to do anything funny. It doesn't try any funny business. I think the, the top left square, it simply just um, represents, you know, again, an arbitrary two features or in a case whereby it's able to have a sense of relative importance um, of features. Maybe like one one feature is way more important in, um, in determining, um, but like, to give you an example, let's say one feature of language is, well, what language is it in? That is like, is it English or Spanish? Is it English or Chinese? Uh, another feature is, um, is is the sentence referring to in the past tense or present tense, right? Um, and I say like, this past or present tense feature, you know, helps you avoid grammatical mistakes, but it's fair enough to assume that the feature of at least knowing what language the question or the query is in, is probably be way more important um, in terms of like, having you avoid errors 
then detect if it's past tense or, or, or present tense, right? So, so again, that's just like one abstract idea of um, the model. So again, if the model only had like two different features or like one, let's say like just one, like, um, or like on the margin, if the, if the model has to represent one more thing and it has to choose between the language detection, detection and the um, past or present tense, it will most likely prioritize choosing to represent, using that one extra feature to represent language and the language type that is this English or French or Chinese, um, as that now probably has way more predictive power or like will have it have way less error than if it was um, instead of trying to product, predict the correct tense but in the wrong language. Um, again, this is a bit of a toy example. Okay, so how do we solve this, right? Again, given this, we suspect this is what models are doing, um, or again, we suspect um, this is why they're able to do it, and this is why they're able to get away with it. Again, they're trying to exploit sparsity um, by compressing stuff. So the paper I shared basically tries to do this um, by tackling a smaller model, right? So they tackle a one-layer transformer, and they pick out one component of the architecture. Again, as I explained, in this, in our typical large transformer, there, every single component is doing some version of this, right? Since this information is flowing through our entire network, um, each discrete component is going to need to have to do some version of this, right? Um, so they focus on the MLP layer, which is what comes after the attention heads. And in the model they use, the dimensions of that, basically like how many um, vectors or how many neurons it has, uh, sorry, how many dimensions it, of each vector has or how many neurons, um, how many neurons that layer has is 512. And what they do is, as seen here on the right, they use something called a sparse over complete order encoder. Um, and basically I'll describe what that means starting from the right, okay? So what is an, an order encoder? And basically an order encoder is um, basically a neural network whose primary purpose is reconstruction. So basically you have um, some input, you have something in the middle, which is like again your, your network, and the job of that network is to try to replicate, to reproduce the output, right? Again, that, that seems kind of silly, like why just bother with this identity transform? Because while well, in some cases, you might want to do something like, okay, co compress dimensions, right? So let's say you have this very like large um, input, you want to find um, interesting, you want to find the most important critical features by compressing it in the middle and seeing how well, okay, like again, let's say something needs five dimensions to, to uh, this input is five dimensions. Um, what are the two most important dimensions of this or two most important like representations of these five dimensions I can take that would have me still do well on reconstructing, right? Um, with with this, like that basically has, you know, the, this this property of feature discovery by compression. Okay, cool. So that's what order encoders do. Um, overcomplete, again, starting from the right to the left describe, overcomplete basically does the slightly opposite version of that, which is instead of compressing, you're basically trying to expand. You're basically trying to give the, the, the order encoder in the middle, again, between the input and your reconstruction of the input, is much larger. That is, you're saying if this neural network representation had way more room to represent stuff, um, what would it look like, right? Um, and remember the whole point of our um, superposition is that we're assuming that like the model we see is actually trying to simulate a much larger model. Again, remember the whole, that's the whole point of superposition, right? Um, so by using this over complete encoder, we're trying to say that cool, whatever representation this MLP um, node has for some input, what if we gave it way more neurons to work with? Um, what would you do with it? Um, that's the overcomplete section. Then the sparse component of that description is saying, like, sure, what if we just go from like you know a a five dimensional inscrutable compressed complex thing to a hundred dimension inscrutable complex thing, right? We're not much better than we started, right? And again, neural networks just like don't really have any incentives to just make things explainable to us. So the sparse component says, okay, in addition to giving you you the, the network more room to work with to like expand to like see what you learned. We want to force you to narrow your learnings, your features, um, to being active in one node at a time, right? Um, I think I, I explained before how just because um, I think it was in this example. I'm just going to jump quickly, right? So just because 
um, I say that, oh, like linearity says you must have as many dimensions as you want features. It doesn't necessarily mean that it will always be one hot, right? You might have a case whereby there's several, you know, there are infinite many orthogonal, um, uh, four orthogonal vectors, like four vectors that form an orthogonal basis that aren't one hot, right? It's kind of like smeared between all the different values. But again, from our, for our convenience to like say that, ah, that neuron is like firing a lot when it sees redness. Um, we want to impose an extra um, basic constraint on the autoencoder to say that, cool, don't just um, try to find representations with more nodes to work with. When you do this, narrow down your learnings, right? Or try to isolate your learnings for one feature to like one node at a time, right? That's basically just for our interpretability benefit. And yeah, that is what a sparse overcomplete autoencoder is. Or usually they usually just ignore the overcomplete part, um, part and just call it a sparse autoencoder. And basically just says, cool, we, we want to give um, neural networks the opportunity to, uh, we want to extract what they've learned by trying to reconstruct representations using more dimensions. Um, and we want this new like extraction to be sparse in such a way that only one uh, node is activated at a time for a given feature that is important. Um, and effectively, that looks like this. So they ran this um, this training for, uh, this training process um, for the sparse auto encoder on their one layer network for the MLP layer. Um, and again, if you see here, they describe um, on the left there you see and they see like the act 512, that means like the activations of the MLP layer typically should have 512 dimensions. Again, that would just mean instead of, one second, instead of like four different blocks here, that'll be 512, right? That's like how big the vector is. Um, so they went from 512 and expanded all the, like, they ran different versions, but the largest ones went up to um, 131K, right? So basically, that would mean if, again, with the network of, of the encoder on the right, if the, on the input and output was 512 different like um, neurons, and in the middle, you had this giant um, 130K um, node network, or a node like layer, basically, that was trying to reconstruct um, the input into the output. Um, and they learned a bunch of stuff. Um, they have a very nice interactive um, application that I encourage you all to check out that basically shows the model learning really interesting things. So one of the um, the neurons they discovered, again, neuron just simply means like, because of this like um, constraint of sparsity, the, the model learns to like isolate some abstract feature to the, literally one of these 130K nodes. Basically like once this feature is present in an input, it just like fires and screams a lot to say like this input is really here. Um, and these features are like so like wide and buried. One of them, for example, um, uh, detects the um, like detects Arabic characters in um, input. Another of them, as you see here, detects um, if a sequence of text is um, probably like a DNA sequence, which you, th you think was pretty wild because like this would just be gibberish. But like there are certain like um, um, like patterns and I guess the actual like letters, for example, that is used for DNA encoding. Um, that seems like such an arbitrary thing that a model will learn, but it did learn this. Um, and you can check out like other esoteric ones that it learns to um, in, in in this reconstruction. And again, feature was present in the 512 MLP, but because it was coked up in all like, like coked up together with the um, superposition uh, in the superposition phase, it was hard to basically like discern. So the whole point of the recorder is basically just to extract these features out there. Um, so like now they become one isolated thing, um, which is kind of brings us full circle to the definition of what a feature is. So again, I've been throwing it around the idea of feature as just a distinct thing a model finds to be interesting, right? As um, but like based like one perhaps more um, narrow definition of it, or I, I guess like, I, I don't wanna say formal, but just like one um, more particular definition of it based on this part I would describe is like a feature is basically a property that a model would encode um, 
would dedicate an entire neuron to would encode using, a, using one neuron if it had enough neurons, right? So, so basically, if there's such a thing that if a model was sufficiently large, would dedicate one neuron to it, um, that thing is a feature, right? Um, but if, if there's a thing that you know, no matter how many neurons it, it had, um, this thing wouldn't have a neuron, it perhaps would be like a part of some other neuron, um, then that thing is not a feature, right? Um, again, it seems kind of circular, but um, it, it turns about, yeah, the precise definition of like features can be kind of gnarly, um, but like for all practical purposes, you know, think of again features in the colloquial sense of just like, you know, a thing that the model finds to be interesting, like squareness or blueness or whatever. Um, and, but the interesting thing, I guess, is that again, like part of the things, part of the ways like a more powerful model is more powerful is because it can indeed encode for more stuff than a smaller one can. Um, and again, as the proposition suggests, the smaller ones actually encode a lot more than they might, than their size alone might suggest, right? Because again, the whole point of this is if indeed there was no superposition, or like if indeed there was nothing weird happening, then this MLP layer would actually only have 512, but they were able to extract you know, way over 100,000 um, reasonable features. Um, uh, so something for sure weird is, is happening. Um, and like, and these features like were consistent with like experimental um, um, validation for, again, like they had different evaluation methods that you can check out in the paper to show like how much confidence they have for it. But basically the features are like very in confidence or incoherence, or at least in like explainability to like a typical human being. Um, but I feel like the number of like, explainable features, high quality features definitely exceeds 512. So indeed um, this compression is happening for sure. And this is like the proof for it. Um, and yeah, the future of this work will basically look like scaling up this autoencoders to work on much larger models and uncover more useful features going forward. Awesome. Um, and that is the talk. Um, thank you for joining here. And I encourage you to yeah, read more of the papers um, out there. I think the Anthropic um, um, blog posts and paper, informal papers and formal papers are a great place to start um, as that basically like represents where the frontier is right now. Um, awesome. Um, thank you for the time. See you later.